hello students uh, welcome to this video segment on the modern elements in literature by Matthew Arnold uh, we had stopped at a point where uh, Arnold quotes from uh, speech by uh, the Chancellor of Cambridge as he was talking to his audience in Manchester and will once again do the speech and then carry on. We must compare the works of other ages with those of our own ages and country. That which, while we feel proud of the immense development of knowledge and power of production, just a minute, which we process, we may learn humility in contemplating the refinement of feeling and intensity of thought manifested in the works of older schools. So what is the focus on? Comparing. And this comparing has a kind of historical context. You are going to compare uh, elements of the present with those which are available to us through history. And see how Arnold summarizes the entire thing. The entire quotation, so to say. To know how others stand, that we may know how we ourselves stand. And to know how we ourselves stand, that we may correct our mistakes and achieve our deliverance, that is our problem. That is not a problem in that sense, that is the objective. Okay, and what is this? He gives it a very utilitarian flavor. As some of you must be knowing that utilitarianism was a very uh, discussed issue in the uh, in the Victorian period, and writers like Ruskin or Dickens were actually reacting to it. Dickens's reaction to it is a kind of a negative reaction, as we often find in his novels, particularly in hard times. But over here. Uh, one aspect of the of utilitarianism is taken and uh, why should this study be there, why should be a comparative study is being seen from a utilitarian standpoint. Uh, it should have a corrective influence on our us. We may correct our mistakes and achieve our deliverance. The deliverance that uh, Buddha speaks about uh, at the anecdote in the beginning, the spiritual deliverance, that's what he talks about. Uh, let's come to the paragraph after the next one, where he actually uh, poses a question right at the beginning. What facts then, let us ask ourselves, what elements of the spectacle before us will naturally be most interesting? To a highly developed age like our own, to an age making the demand which we have described for an intellectual deliverance by means of the complete intelligence of its own situation. Okay, so what are the aspects of an of a age that has actually experienced the intellectual deliverance? What are the aspects? And this would be the most interesting to this particular study and most interesting for a highly developed age like ours, our own. Obviously he is referring to his own time which is Victorian age. Of course the poet Arnold does not consider itself to be a highly developed age and it's quite true uh, and we know it from our reading of the Dover Beach. But over here at least he is talking about uh, the material developments, the material and the developments in natural sciences. Of course, it was a most mobile age, uh, the Victorian period, a lot of things happened. Uh, by calling it a highly developed age, he is actually talking about its material ad advancements. A significant, we will later see whether he qualifies it to be such a momentous period. Uh, 
uh, and you will find that he actually prefers the Elizabethan age to this Victorian age later. Uh, now he says that uh, for an age to actually be an age of deliverance, there should be a kind of a parallel development. The parallel development of uh, science, technology, the material aspects of life, as well as that of literature. Let's come to the last sentence of this paragraph. A significant, a highly developed, a culminating epoch, on the one hand, a comprehensive and commensurate and adequate literature on the other. So it will be a significant period, a developed, a highly developed one in the material point of view, a culminating epoch in the sense that it's a culmination of the earlier efforts and all of this this aspect is material okay and then that will be again uh, followed by a great literature okay a comprehensive a commensurate and adequate literature so you look at his choice of words a comprehensive is a literature that covers almost every aspect of life commensurate a literature that matches with the dignity of the period again adequate uh, refers to a literature that is adequate enough to reflect all the aspects of life you see uh, the Victorian age if we talk about the Victorian age you see in the Victorian age you can say that first time the working class gets reflected say in Dickens's novels in Hardy's novels before that there was hardly the presence of a working class there were presences but not as uh, you know significant characters so it's a period of course later he would uh, he is not so elative about the Victorian period but if we, in fact, look at the Victorian period for our own sake, we'll find that it's a period that, uh, which had a literature that reflected almost all the aspects of life. And perhaps this is what he means as uh, an adequate literature. On the other, those, these will naturally be the objects of deepest interest to our modern age. Of course, by modern age, he doesn't uh, designate what we mean as modern age. It's just the age preceding the modern age, it's Victorian age. From Arnold, needless to say, this was his modern age. Such an epoch and such a literature are in fact modern, in the same sense in which our own age and literature are modern. They are founded upon a rich past and upon an instructive, upon an instructive fullness of experience. A fullness of experience experience not only of one category of life okay literature as you know it's repeatedly told holds the mirror up to life now it's not one category of life one segment of life but many segments of life as it were okay this is what he is actually talking about literature should be reflecting that and it's only then that we can call it adequate literature or to use his words a comprehensive a commensurate and adequate literature now and the point that we didn't mention over there is a rich past it should be based on a rich tradition okay for a Hellenic a Hellenistic writer like him or I say a votary of Hellenism better to say like him you know, the rich tradition, particularly the uh, classical tradition of literature, is extremely important. Okay. So, let's come to the next part. Why don't you do, uh, do a little bit of independent thinking? You remember uh, the influence that metamorphosis, over its metamorphosis, had on Shakespeare. This was the classical influence. And the classical influence is, in fact, 
a very important aspect of literature. Uh, even on a uh, writer like Shakespeare, about whom it was said he knew little Latin and less Greek, you can see that classical influence was quite important, quite a potent influence on him. Uh, so uh, the tradition is what matters. You know, you are reminded of T.S. Eliot's, Eliot's very well-known modern uh, essay, Tradition and Individual Talent. Uh, you see how there Eliot makes it uh, a necessity for tradition and innovation to come together. Now, here you can see how Again, the tradition is given its due importance when Arnold writes, they are founded upon a rich past. Now, uh, sometimes it can so happen that the age is a very illustrious age in terms of its material advancements, but uh, the literature is not equally, uh, you know, equally rich. And it talks about that uh, that kind of a case in the next paragraph. It may, however, happen that a great epoch is without a perfectly adequate literature. It may happen that a great age, a great nation, has attained a remarkable fullness of political and social development without intellectually taking the complete measure of itself, without adequately representing that development in its literature. Okay? Now, uh, you can have a great nation with a perfectly, without a perfectly adequate literature. The nation has developed in a major way but maybe it has not fully reflected the development in literature. And what would you do in that case? In this case, you have to be selective. In this case, the epoch, the nation itself, uh, will still be an object of the greatest interest to us, but the literature will be an object of less interest to us. The facts, the material spectacle are there, but the contemporary view of facts the intellectual interpretation are inferior and inadequate. So, uh, in such an age, there would be uh, a matter of interest in its uh, material advancements, but not in the literature. It will be regarded as an age in which a material advancement did happen in a major way, but did not reflect it uh, in the domain of intellectual commentary on it, intellectual interpretation, which is that of literature. And now the vice versa comes in the next uh, paragraph with which we are going to end this particular segment. It may happen on the other hand that the great author, that a particular, uh, that a particular powerful literature are found in an age and nation less great and powerful than themselves. It may happen that a literature, that a man of genius may arise adequately to the representation of a greater, a far, a more highly developed age than that in which they appear. It may happen that a literature completely interprets its epoch and yet has something over that it has a force, a richness, a geniality, a power of view which the materials of its disposition are insufficient adequate to empire. Sometimes the literature supersedes life. Okay, the material advancement has, advancements have not been so much so, but the literary advancements have been great. And what will you do in such a case? Just the reverse of what we did in the previous case. In such a case, the literature will be more interesting to us than the epoch. We are going to study the literature in isolation. 
not so much the epoch because this epoch is hardly of any interest when it comes to the uh, comes from the standpoint of intellectual deliberation the interpreting power the illuminating and revealing intellect are there but the spectacle on which they throw their light is not fully worthy of them now uh, such a wonderful expression uh, the interpreting power the illuminating and revealing intellect man's intelligence is quite high but what is being described does not does not uh, you know move along with the level of that intelligence it does not do justice to that intelligence so to say so you will not have only have to be a comparatist but you will also have to be a selective person in your selective critic in your choice a selective uh, uh, interpreter in your choice of a great materially progressive period and a great literature the both should go hand in hand if they do not go hand in hand then whichever is great has to be taken with this note we are going to end today's uh, this particular segment in the next segment we are going to carry on with the same text thank you